do you have any mistakes, regrets, or horror stories that you could share with us? Who wants to start? Um, what comes to mind most recently for me, uh, we, we do a lot of molding, right? So all of our, and if any of you have ever done any molding or injection molding or polyurethane molding, you know, the process is very long and it's extraordinarily expensive. We created a product most recently called the box squat pad. It's a molded polyurethane foam pad that goes on tops of a, a box squat platform. At no fault to our own, uh, it was actually an error on the tool shops uh, part. But we had paid ten thousand dollars for a tool that had the logo off centered into it. It was uh, it was at first devastating because uh, you know we didn't want to pay ten grand to have another product made up and. We just kind of learned to laugh at it and say, you know, it's because Abmat thinks outside the box squat. So it's quite <laughs> but, uh, it also parlayed into uh, uh, them feeling really bad. And so they gave us this mold for free. So in terms of horror stories, that's, that was the scariest one for me in the most recent months. So did you roll with that or did you get oh, it straight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not a single person has recognized it. And I'm probably an idiot for just even calling it out right now. It, <laughs> it's so infinitesimally small. It's like a, 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 an eighth of an inch off to the left. And you just, you, you can't notice it unless you really measure it. Who's next? Patrick, I know you have one. At least you have a few. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, so with, with these whole kind of, you know, horror stories, regrets, um, I don't, I don't necessarily like to call them regrets in a sense. Um, each one of them has been a learning experience. And, you know, if I can lump everything into something, I guess it would just come those things that happened are a result of essentially us not staying true to what we want to be. Probably the, the biggest one that I can think of is in our early days, contacting a kind of like a bulk manufacturer out of China or whatever you want to call it. And then us getting a container full of equipment that was essentially just junk. And that was a huge learning experience and sort of molded our thought process now, you know, whether we're either going to build it ourselves or find somebody here stateside that we can have a face-to-face -face relationship. Like, you know, Dylan and I have met before, have, and, you know, we have things in the works that we're working on together and just that relationship and the mutual respect that comes from both sides. You know, I know that he's going to step up and go to bat for me and he's going to provide us the highest quality product that we can use in conjunction with our own products versus just either emailing somebody on the other side of the world and then equipment showing up and we really have no idea what it's going to be or how it's going to be. And that was a very, very expensive lesson when you're sort of a, a broke college student and, you know, you... I remember even the, we were working with the logistics company that got it in and they were like, oh yeah, by the way, you know, this is going to be 4,800 bucks like that you have to pay us. And I was like, shit. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, I remember going to my girlfriend at the time and be like, hey, do you, do you have a uh, five grand that I can borrow? <laughs> and um, yeah, so, you know, she's my wife now, so it's all good. But the, um, yeah, that was probably the biggest thing. You know, one of the many reasons why, you know, I value and want to hold true to the, uh, you know, whole American manufacturing and American built thing. So that's, that's probably it. Anyone else have anything? Um, back in, uh, it was 20, the summer of 2021, we had a shipment of fractional plates that came in. And uh, we have, there was a, the plates get tumbled. So like the edge is like kind of sharp. Um, the, just the way it's manufactured. So they get tumbled to kind of comb over that burr. Well, the coat company forgot to tumble them. And we got, you know, 10 pallets of plates that all had like a sharp burr on it. So we had to send them back. Well, they were already coated. So we kept a bunch and we hand sanded a whole bunch because I was out. So we hand sanded a bunch that we could still sell. And then we sent them back and, and we decided to tumble them coated because if you do it a short amount of time, it's like a vibratory tumble. They use a real fine stone that goes over it, um, that it could get rid of that burr, but without recoating it. So we decided to do that, sent them back and uh, they sent them back and they looked terrible. So then I had to, I made that executive decision to do that. So then we had to send them back again to get them recoated, sandblasted, then recoated. The problem was when we got them back, about 5,000 of them were in the back of the truck. They had fallen over. And we had to pick up all these plates. Um, I don't I actually don't want to say we because I was actually on vacation. My operations manager, it was the worst vacation I've ever taken. You know, he was there uh, picking up one by one plates. And like, I have these things layer packed so they don't touch each other, so they don't scratch. They're literally throwing them in 55 gallon drums. Ting, ting, ting. We had to send them back and they recoded them, sent them back to us. They fell over again. 
on the trip back. So they don't know how to wrap pallets. And um, yeah, and that cost me several thousand dollars to get them recoded, uh, even though it was sort of their fault, but it was sort of my fault because I took the chance of like, hey, let's just tumble them because I need the plates. Um, so that, that was a couple thousand dollar mistake. And um, that's kind of stuff you don't show on like Instagram and social media and stuff because it was like a disaster of epic proportions of like thousands of tiny plates in the back of a truck rolling around like a tumbling machine. And just because of like poor wrapping and things like that. So, but yeah, that, that's probably one of the, the biggest debacles in micro games history there. But we did get them all recoded. They just have, some of them will have like little dings and dents in the actual metal. They, they turned out all right after, after all that. And that was right around the time you, you somewhat went full time. Yeah, that's right. That yeah, so, so it's just a ton of stuff, we were, I'm sure. Yeah, we were selling a lot. So, like, we needed them. Like like I said, I, I held some back, and we hand sanded with, like, 1,000 grit sandpaper to make sure we had orders, you know, we could fulfill for customers. Um, and I think I even drove up there and picked up, like, a pallet in my truck early before they could ship it back. But it fell over anyway. And then we're, we're arguing back and forth about how to pack these things. And, you know, but, but yeah, it was, that was a pretty big deal for us. Awesome. It was terrifying, but... <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing uh steve you had something yeah so uh i never posted about it but if anyone paid attention like when we first were like doing teasers of the landmine and showing pictures of it the bracket that bolted up to the rack was different and i had two tabs on it so instead of the bearing being mounted like horizontal it was vertically which gave it like unlimited range of motion and all that stuff so i had you know, did all the testing, had everything cut. And after I started welding these, I realized that the, cause I did tab and slot for the tabs, the slots were too big. So unless I welded extremely slow, the brackets would work just because of how that design was. And I didn't anticipate like, okay, the speed of manufacturing and all that stuff. So I have 500 brackets, Orders. tabs here that are just sitting in boxes because after that, after about 10 or 12 in, I'm like, okay, I need to change this. <laughs> so that was not a cheap mistake. And then I want to throw them all out. Yeah, but, there's uh, got to be something you can do with them. Yeah, but <laughs> for me, like, I couldn't just let that, because once you launch something, it's a lot harder to make changes and stuff like that. And I was just like, man, I don't want to have to make a change down the road and, and all that stuff. And another one was I, we had a pretty good size run of the jacks delivered and the way they it's very difficult to get the finish that we have on these it's like done with a time saver and a lismac machine and the challenge is to get the grain in there while taking off the burrs on the edges kind of like mike was saying with that's done with tumbling and i received a, a pallet that we were like had a bunch of back borders on and instead of sending it back because of all the edges being sharp i had to hand chamfer with a hand chamfering tool like every both sides of each jack and then hand finish them with scotch bright like this. So my triceps were like obliterated. <laughs> but you got to do the things, like there's certain things you got to do in order to get by. Like we, we found out we were, one of the pallets we had of boxes, there was, it was a different box that I had them organized incorrectly. And I had about like 70 orders to fulfill. So what I ended up doing is cutting open all the boxes of our other product that had the other color jack in and just transferring them just to get the order fulfilled. Two steps back to go one step forward kind of thing. Brutal. All right, Jason, do you have anything to share? Or not really? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I constantly live in a nightmare right now. Uh, I'm still pretty young, you know, so we're still dialing stuff in, uh, especially with partners. It's a huge reason why we're trying to bring everything in house. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting 10 feet from a pallet that has 40 scrapped units on it. There's a pallet behind me. It's got 70 scrapped parts on it. I ordered 100 parts. 70 of them were out of tolerance. Uh, we run pretty tight tolerances because our stuff, you know, bolts to other people's stuff. Uh, and that channel we use has to be really tight. And uh, I'm sure, as everybody in this group knows, not everybody pays attention to detail like we do, uh, you know, when we're really close to the product. So uh, it's been something where we're you know, having to plane UHMW parts to make up for tight, tight bend tolerances, you know, when they got the channel too tight or whatever, uh, you know, making spacers just fit right. Or we ran a thing of tubes and had the wrong size hole for the rivet. So we had to hand drill every single one of them. And I mean, there's eight holes on every single unit. So you just kind of put that math together. And like Steve said, it starts adding up the time, but uh, the power racks, you know, finding those little shortcuts, I come from everything from a user perspective, so not from a manufacturing perspective. So after you build what you 
thought was going to be awesome. And you're like, that took way too long to build, <laughs> you know? So you go back and like start trimming some of that stuff. So no, no, like real horror stories, but like Patrick said, lots and lots of learning opportunities. Makes sense. I like the yeah. way you phrase it. Not a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. Yeah. You guys were extremely <laughs> positive. 